Yeah. Yes, happy International Women's Day. Yeah, same How fitting. Thanks How fitting to have this interview. I know, I know, right? Yeah, That's for awesome. sure. So this is, yeah, this is great. So happy, and a happy Monday. You know what? It's every day, every Monday, I just feel like it's so monotonous. Like everyone hates Mondays and I don't yeah. understand why. I just think yeah, it's- Yeah, Monday's my day off. So I enjoy Mondays. I don't understand the hate the Monday gets, but regardless, yeah. let's just I jump know. right into this interview. Let's do it. Yeah. Thank you again for having me in this, this amazing platform that you've created. So I'm super excited. Yeah. I'm, I think that your interview is going to be a really fun one because I mean, I love soccer. And so when I first heard you speaking on clubhouse, I was like, I need to have, I need to have her on my podcast so she can talk about the wealth of experiences that she's had. And now you're here and it's awesome. I'm so excited. Yeah. Yeah. And clubhouse. I'm, I feel I'm like, it's the most addicting app. I don't even want to look at my screen time for what I spend on clubhouse it's so, anymore. It's so bad. Yeah. And yeah. Clubhouse playing in the background of just daily life as well. Yeah, I know. It's such a great uh, tool. Sometimes I think if it's like Apple's way to find out how many people have an Apple and an iOS device or something. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't realize it was only on iOS until I tried to invite one of my friends who's on, I think, Samsung. And he was like, I don't, I can't get this app. <laughs> I don't know what you're inviting oh me. Oh my God. And I'm like, you're oh missing my God. out. You're really missing yeah. out. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So yeah, no, thanks. Uh, thanks again for that shout out about Clubhouse and, and yeah. meeting there and and being on this platform now. Yeah, so let's let's just talk about your getting to this point. So start yeah. your very first experience with the sport of soccer. Yeah, so we were living in Toronto um, and uh, we moved to a city. There's, a, there's an amusement park here uh, called Canada's Wonderland. And uh, it's, I think, the biggest uh, amusement park here in, in Canada. And we moved there and there wasn't like anything but like farms and an amusement park. And I, uh, we moved and I have a brother 10 months, three weeks older than me. So basically my twin and, um, we grew up doing everything together and, um, it was, it was, he got into soccer and then all of a sudden I wanted to play or he was doing ball hockey or hockey and I wanted to get into it. So I was like three years old and he was four when we moved here and, uh, he started playing and I wanted to play and, and, and be a part of it. So I think they just like kind of gave me a Jersey and just said, okay, just go kick a ball around, but you're not actually on the team. So I did that for a while with him and played with him and then um, got into girls soccer um, and had an interesting journey. It's crazy to think, I, so I'm a 90, to think about not having a full girls league and a girls division until I was maybe 10 or 11, where there was enough teams that you weren't playing the same two or three teams, that there was enough pool of players that it was competitive and that they were into soccer and it wasn't kind of at their recreational level. So I think back and that's like, you know, uh, like early two thousands. And you think like, wow, that's the 20 years ago, 20 years that's passed and you know, where we're at now. Um, but yeah, so I, I did that in the youth system. And then um, I got called into the provincial program um, and it was amazing experience to be selected. And all of a sudden um, I'm cut. I was the last player cut out of my my age group. And I remember getting a letter in the mail. This was before email. I still have that letter framed. Um, when I moved to my new house here, I remember like going through my like box of memories and I saw it and I was like, Oh my God, I can't believe I still have this. Um, but it was kind of like a, a moment to reflect. Um, and that was two years ago when I found that letter and, um, I got cut cause I was short. Um, and that was basically it. Like I just, the physicality for me being a center back. So like a sweeper at the time, I just wasn't, um, big enough. I was small, um, and I was playing a position that I knew I was going to, um, be challenging, but I'm very outgoing, very vocal. So I thought that would be able to, um, kind of elevate me into, to my performance. But yeah, it was a huge moment in my career because I found myself at 13 wanting to quit. Um, and I find a lot of players kind of give up at 13 to 15 in the sport due to so many reasons, but I found myself in that statistic and I took a trip to Italy, um, being an Italian background, I took my, my, my first trip to Italy. Um, and, um, this team kind of invited me and said, Hey, we need an extra player. Why don't you come and play with us in Italy? Um, and just kind of play around. And I actually got scouted to go back for high school to Italy. 
So I find my, myself getting cut um, in eighth grade from the provincial program. And then I find myself six months later playing in Italy and doing high school online. And um, there was nothing around me being, me being short, me being too small to play the position I was. It was just a moment where I could be myself. And that's where I truly fell in love with the game. I loved the game before um, I was a multi-sport athlete. I played basketball, but that was the true moment where I said, okay, this is, this is it. This, I love the sport. This is all I want to do. And um, yeah, I spent time there. I got, I got called into the Italian national program um, for the U19. I got to travel around on like a private jet um, for our team, like small flights. So for me, those were like big moments um, eating and, and like, getting tours like all paid for that was like huge for me at such a young age to like experience that um and i remember taking our first like charter chartered flight as a team to sardinia the island and like just getting on this little jet um which just our team was like one of the coolest experiences in in my in my book but yeah and then i came back did high school um and then had a lot of interest in the united states the i ended up at a junior college and then transferred division two tons of division one offers um but I wasn't the best in school. I never really attended class. I was always someone who was like playing in, in the streets or like traveling. I would like drive from high school. This is so bad. My mom's going to listen to this and like yell at me, even though I'm <laughs> done. High school. I would like leave high school because I had a car and like drive to other people's schools and like just play soccer with them and miss class. So um, my grades kind of were, were, were obviously reflective of that. Um, but the junior college experience was a life changing experience for me. I think I needed that to elevate myself. Um, played at the division two level, um, and tore everything in my knee. Um, it kind of ended my playing career. I knew my playing career was coming to an end because I had so many like little nicks and, and bumps, um, as a youth player, nothing that kept me out of the game for a while, like Osgood slatters, like stuff like that. But I knew it was probably c coming to an end. I wasn't playing a lot at the division two school. There was like a lot of hype around me as, as a junior college player going into division two. I did okay. But then tore kind of everything in my knee and, and decided to hang up the boots. But the reason why we're, we're talking is because I had the best college coach that he knew. Yes, he recruited me as a, as a player, um, but we started talking about coaching and philosophy. And I would like in the session, like tell him, oh, we should do this instead and like change the session. And he's like, be quiet. You're a player. Like, just, do, just do this. But we were, we were two people who just like fell in love with, with the game. He's a Liverpool and Juventus fan. I love Ju Juventus. So we would go and like watch games together and stuff. And he told me like, go into coaching. And um, I, I got right into coaching right after um, I was working for Nike um, and coaching on the side and then decided one day um, I got out of a relationship um, that was kind of holding me back from going. And I got out of that relationship. And then I just said, this is the time now to fly across to England and become a coach. And that's what I did. Um, and I spent a year there and I, I talk about it uh, sometimes to, to my family is, and friends is that I was sacrificing living in a hostel with 16 people, having like $3 to my name a day, working for Royal Mail, um, which is like FedEx, sorting packages, just trying to make enough to, to pay for my education. And yeah, I came back as a coach and um, have been been in Canada since 2015. So yeah, big journey in it, uh, lots of ups and downs. But I think everything in in life and all my journey has has taught me a valuable experience. And yeah, I, I love what I'm doing. I love coaching and uh, waking up every day to to be a coach and be someone in the soccer industry is is amazing. So how did you how did the Italian team find you? Yeah. So it, it's so crazy because I, I was playing calcetto, which is kind of like futsal. Um, and I was playing for a small town. So the school program that I was doing, um, if anyone is familiar, like it was two hours away from Rome, right on the Adriatic Sea. So Pescara is like a big town. It's known as like a, a fashion capital and a fashion city. So I was like 20 minutes outside in this little town called Rosetto. Most people would never know where it is. And um, that's where the school was. So they put us up in a residence. The residence was actually really cool because it was across street from the beach, which was really, really amazing. My family um, is from that part of uh, the province of Abruzzo. So like my mom's side. So it was nice, like being immersed in that culture and like the northern part of, of Italy. Um, and so 
we were in this residence with like all athletes and there was like professional basketball players who played there, um, soccer players. So I was just put there because the schooling for like the international schools. So like the English speaking school was not far from there. And that was the place where a lot of the athletes stayed. So there was two other Canadians. They were much older. They weren't in high school. They weren't even in college. They're like, they were older women who were Canadian playing professionally for this team. But obviously I was so young, I was 14 and they were like 22, 23 at the time. So I was just kind of playing pickup soccer, playing for like a local team. And then the local team, I was obviously too good um, and too skillful for them. And then I moved up and then eventually I was on their team and I was 14 playing with older women. Um, and it was like third division at the time. And then I moved up to my own age, second division, own age, first division. And then I was representing our province, Abruzzo. And then that's how I got picked into the national team, but it was all through like 11 v 11 or Calcetto, which is like small, like street style soccer, which I wasn't used to playing here. So it was like really rough and stuff, but oh my God, it was amazing. So when I watch, for example, the U S women's national team, they're coming from structured backgrounds. They're coming from D one institutions to their professional teams. And then they're being handpicked into the national team. It sounds like your experience was very different than that. Yeah. Like yeah, essentially um, nothing like that at all. No, nothing. Like I was just in the right place and uh, right place, right moment um, kind of kind of thing. Like it was just sometimes luck, like even the national like U19, I was at I representing our province and someone had walked up to my parents and said, um, hey, like, tell me more about your daughter. Like, I know she's because they always called me the American um, and um and they kept saying like, it, she's obviously an Italian citizen and um, can she stay and play with us? Um, so that's how everybody knew me as the American. That's what uh, everybody called me down there. So yeah, it was pretty, pretty unique, but yeah, I was just kind of found in the right place at the right time and people advocating for, for me. Um, and obviously as like a young kid, I didn't really have a voice to say, hey, I'm good enough. You don't know. And especially getting cut from a provincial program, I thought I wasn't good enough. So for people to advocate for me was was massive. Um, and it's, you know, inspired me now and, and built this confidence in me. Yeah, I mean, that's that's so insane that you're going to a country that you're not even from. And people are there advocating for your your soccer ability. That's really cool. Yeah. And, and so different than being here in, in North America, the uh, European lifestyle is much different. Like I had to just really, uh, really quickly, like it, it sounds so crazy looking back at it, but like after practice, like showering, like the players all shower and here, like after you practice, you just leave and go home in your car smelling and, and dirty. So for me, like getting used to that, or then like eating a big lunch and then the city shutting down from like two to six o'clock, and then like going to train and then eating really late at night was like different for me to adjust to. So it was like little things that they would like make fun of me for, but like I wasn't part of that culture because I was so used to like the North American culture of, of, of sports. So yeah, it was, it was interesting. And that was before social media where I could look up if I moved to Italy, what is the culture like? Like you didn't know, right? So you just go into it and kind of like have to adjust right away and like showering for the first couple training sessions. I was like, no, I'm not comfortable with that. And then you have to get comfortable with it. So there was no one that was telling you, Hey, you should probably learn more about this or do something, whatever it may be this way, as opposed to the way that you think it's done. They just kind yeah, of, yeah, no fire. <laughs> Yeah. Like when I was like, I remember like one of my first training sessions, everybody was like getting undressed and I was like, well, oh, maybe they're just changing into other clothes. And then they're like all in the shower and I'm like, what's, and I'm just like taking off my stuff. And like, I left and the coach is like, well, like, cause they wait outside at the bus and they're like, well, what are you doing? And I, I, I didn't know, cause obviously I spoke Italian, but I was still so shy. And I was like, well, I, I don't know what to do. Like, I didn't know we shower. Like, I'm not like comfortable. Like, I don't even have like soap or anything. They're like, no, no, that's provided. Like, just go back in. I'm like, I don't have a towel. Like, I don't have anything. So yeah, those were, those were, that was interesting. But yeah, no one told me I, I literally learned on, on the fly. Like, and I was so, I would eat before practice and then we would go out to eat. And they would like be feeding me like crazy. I'm like, well, I'm not hungry I ate before. And they're like, what do you mean you ate before? Like no one eats before. So it was just, it was just a unique experience. And um, 
yeah, I, I loved it. And um, now I still find myself like I eat a big lunch and then a very small dinner if, if I even get time for dinner. So I'm still immersed in that culture a little. That's, that's cool that even now that you're removed from that experience, you're still seeing implementation of those lifestyle choices. Yeah. Yeah. And like, uh, I still swear in Italian and on the field and not in English. So yeah, I just find myself like saying words sometimes in, in Italian. I'm like, Oh no, wait, no one will understand that. I have to say it in English. So it's, yeah, it's still like, Oh my God, that was 2003. So it's still, yeah, I guess I don't really think about it except like now that we're talking that I think about like everyday life and how much that culture is in my life here in North America. Yeah. So like when you were going up through your youth sport and then into your college, your JUCO experience, and then your D2 experience. Was there any pressure around the mental game of soccer or was that really not a topic that was even broached? Yeah, I think um, it wasn't approached or talked about, but there was a lot of pressure, especially from the JUCO school I attended. I think they were like 0 and 14 or 1 and 14. And I remember out of high school when they recruited me, I, I like, I love the coach. We're still very good friends. Um, he's gotten out of coaching now, but he was someone that wrote an article and the school wrote an article that she'll be one of the best to wear the Jersey. So going in as like this immature high school student to like now all eyes on you playing with players, you're a year older, like a couple years older than you and being a captain right away was like this, this pressure of like coming in and like having to live up to his expectation. And the first couple games I did very well, I was scoring goals, assisting, um, but we, we ended up coming against an opponent um, and this was a huge li life lesson. I still, I'm very close with a couple of the players on the team. Um, and we came against this one team and they maybe had like three or four players on me and like dirty stuff, like shots to the back and like pulling my hair and like stuff was the, the referee wasn't looking and like near like the middle of the game, they just got me on a tackle and like said something to me in my ear. And I, I don't remember, I like blacked out, got a red card for it. Um, and I was suspended. And it was a moment where I knew the team's like mental state now is like, Oh my God, we have to play without Maria. And I was like, Oh my God, that like, it's just like, don't think about that. And like, now I'm, I'm suspended for a couple games and now they have to go through this feeling of like, they don't have anyone to get the ball to them or pass. Or like, I remember they're doing training sessions, trying to like, like make a playmaker like me. So it was just crazy to have that pressure. Um, I obviously rose, rose to it, but I remember like having to call my mom and like my family to be like, this is the pressure on me. Um, I remember <laughs> me and my friend, um, still my best friend to the, to this day will be my maid of honor, Lindsay going out to eat the night before at Texas roadhouse. And for me, like Texas roadhouse was my spot. Like it's not here in Canada. So we went out and we ate like crazy. And then I played the worst game I've ever played. It was the first, one of the first games, my brother and my mom came to watch me as a, as a junior college player. And I didn't perform at all. And we ended up losing to a game we needed to win. And, um, but yeah, that mental performance side of things to have that pressure was was crazy. And then I go into the division two experience and they know about me from before because the school wasn't far. And I didn't live up to that, that expectation of she's coming in as a all American, all conference, all region player. She's going to be like lights out. And I didn't come in and live to those expectations um, because the pressure of now playing with players in a division two setting at one of the best universities in the United States at the time um, would definitely, definitely got to me. And there was no one to talk to and have an outlet. So did you encounter hate during that point where you weren't living up to the expectations that not only your team had for you, but also potentially the fans when they saw that you were coming to their institution? Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, it was so tough to watch my mom and family and friends come watch me play from when they watch me at my, my Juco, because I was only there a year and then transferred to division two to see them in, in the stands and like not not even to have like a sniff at the field, like warm up and then not play um, was definitely tough. Um, and I wasn't a player. Like I, I know some players now and in, in the games change to go up to the coach and be like, why am I not playing? I'll transfer and stuff. I know I had to earn my time, but I didn't know what more to do because I was so used to just doing what I did at the junior college and, and that being enough. So I didn't know how to kind of push myself and apply myself. And then like, I realized, well, there's six people who play my position. I need to beat them out. And that kind of clicked 
a little bit into the first like fall season. And that kind of clicked to me that I need to show up and, and not be as immature as I am in the change room and not be that kind of class clown or like teen clown. Like I need to, to focus. And that was kind of a changing moment. And then I remember starting and, and all of that, but yeah, definitely a lot of pressure is definitely nerve wracking. Even like teammates of mine who are playing in the division two uh league um there were some players out of high school who went into division two and now they're seeing me for the first time in college and i'm not playing and you know they're they're going at me on on social media on facebook at the time and stuff and yeah the pressure really really got to me and and then i had to switch it on myself with no one it was just kind of like i woke up one day and said i need to beat out these players i don't care if they're seniors or sophomores or juniors i need to go in and 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 get their get their playing time essentially and how does that experience differ from the sports psych landscape now and the way that you, impl- you implement sports ecology into, for example, your private coaching? Yeah. So now I find I, I do a lot of lessons. Like I don't try and like, obviously I educate myself on um, psychology or like latest trends or mindset and, and stuff, something I didn't have, but I bring a lot of stories and my life lessons or our coaches life lessons in the sport to our players. My players know, I tell about like different moments in, in my career. And some of them we've talked about. And a lot of those moments, I tell them the reason why I'm telling this story. Um, and, uh, yeah, I try to, to do that, but a lot of those life lessons will stay with me for forever. And I think that's why sport is the best Avenue for people to be in and, 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 and be a part of as their youth days is because it teaches you so many life lessons. So I think now I educate myself way more than um, the average coach, because I think the psychology, especially in female players, the mindset piece is so important, um, especially for the generation of, of social media and um, the pressure um, players do have um, from that. So yeah, definitely bring in my own style um, and, and work life lessons and obviously the education that I have. Um, I have a soccer in football, so football in, in psychology degree from the FA. Um, and uh, that was unique because I was really interested in spending time on the psychology side of soccer um, when I was going through my licensing. So what was that process of getting certified like? Is it extensive or is there an exam that you have to pass? Yeah, I think I actually have the book here somewhere in this room and and someone had given it to me when I was in the in the course. So I was like on one of my like basic levels um, that anyone could kind of go to. I started right at the bottom um, and worked my way up through the uh, licensing system. And someone had given me that book. I remember it was like a, a parent or something was like, hey, read this book. And I read it and I was like, oh, my God, like what England does and I'm, I'm certified in the United States and I'm hoping Canada implements is like, they break down these like four corners of, of what you should run in a session and how you should coach. And it's like technical, tactical, social, physical, and psychological. And you try to implement one or two points from those corners into a session. So I spent a lot of time in like the blue zone, which is a psycho psychological zone to say like the who, what, where, when, how. So I was really interested in that. And then this just added to my experience. I took the first two FA levels in psychology in person, and then I finished the last one online. Um, and I remember one of my main pieces that I wrote um, and I saw a uh, advert for like a, a, um, a YouTube video was the car ride home. And I remember writing about that because my car ride home wasn't like other players. The car ride home for me was probably my mom was a single mom when I was going through high school. So it wasn't my mom driving me home. Most of the time it was someone else on the team, a coach, a, a friend. Um, and when my mom did come, um, I think she was so busy worrying about like other kids, like our, uh, my brother and my sister. And like, she was watching it and, and helping me, but she was never someone to yell at me or like, give me that, that, that tough love in the car. She was someone who let me vent. So I never really had that like tough car ride home experience, but I know so many players do struggle with that aspect. So I remember writing a piece on that and it, it, it was really interesting to, to kind of sit back and say, what does that car ride home sound like for some players? Um, you know, what's the message being said to, to the player after a big game or after a practice. So what did you find regarding that space, either positively or negatively as you're driving back from a game? Yeah. So I think um, I did a lot of research and asked so many people in courses, like, like they, 
it like I would ask them like, hey, what does your car rides uh, home from from practice sound like with your with your son or daughter? And they would say like, sometimes I'm too hard on them, or sometimes I let them talk, or or give them space. So I came up with, and it's used a lot. Like I didn't recreate this, but I found that like what I was trying to get out of that article was I was trying to say that let it let the player speak first, let the player talk up talk about the experience and if it's quiet it's quiet give them the 24 hours and I find myself I implement a lot of those rules with teams that I coach now is that 24 hour rule because in the heat of mo uh, heat of the moment sometimes things can be exchanged where if you had 24 hours to sleep it off and kind of think about it and reflect on it it might be a different conversation so I really try to emphasize that now um, especially after writing that piece and having that background is that's 24 hour rule um, let the players speak because again the worst thing and I could only imagine um, going in that car ride and, and just getting yelled at from your coach and now you're yelled at by a parent or a guardian yeah so I mean, I, my brother, my younger brother and I played sports throughout our entire childhood and then up until college, up until high school. And the car ride home was such an integral part of our, our sport experience because our, our home life is very open and we talk a lot about a lot of things. It's a very open dialogue. And that was always a very interesting part to me because they were not experiencing that, that soccer game with me. And then they would ask these nice questions like, hey, how did the game go? And it just, I don't know, it was like a almost a disconnect. Like would it have been better or more effective if we had just sat in silence? Mm -hmm. So like, do you, do you see that kind of dichotomy of, of bombarding your child with questions versus a completely silent car ride? Yeah, it's, it's such a, it's such a, like, and as you were saying that I was thinking like the silence versus uh, putting on music or their favorite song or something. Um, I don't know. I, I'm uh, hoping when I have a, a, a child that uh, I obviously could be the like jokey, like don't sweat it kind of parent, but I don't know what it's like as that parent who has an opinion or played soccer and is so passionate about it or sport in general, because I know a lot of the parents I have in my, my community are ex players, ex athletes, and they're so passionate about it. Um, any sport, but especially soccer in particular, because that's the, my background is it's so because the score is not end to end bucket a bucket like basketball or, or hockey. It's so quick it's, it's very much a low scoring um, game and those moments that build up and to lose on like a one nil loss is, is tough. So I, I, I don't know, like it, it's that silence. And I think now with the phone too is, is big, but what I tell my players all the time and like my players see me like speaking in my watch or like writing notes in my phone, I'm, I'm, I'm doing that. So that way I can reflect back on that practice or that moment. Um, I used to write everything down, but now I'm looking at my writing saying, I don't even know what that says. So I'm pretty much like now on the technology side of things. And I really use that. So that way I could go back and say, okay, in this moment, this happened. And this is something we can address. Or I look back at it 24 hours later. I'm like, oh, this moment doesn't mean anything. It won't help the culture of the team we're trying to create. So I really try to do that with my players when they get in the car just take that five seconds to write in your notes, your thoughts, um, your feelings and go back. And then once you have a shower or you eat and you're in peace that you can go and like really reflect on the game or speak into like, I'm, I'm a crazy person. When I drive home, I speak into my voice notes. Um, and uh, I, but I do that. So that way I can reflect back after that game and that experience. So that's what I try to tell my players is to take that couple seconds um, in the car or, um, in the parking lot to write down your feelings right in that moment and then go back and, and revisit it. So you put a lot of emphasis on self-reflection in the moment. And then once you've kind of calmed down and the wound or excitement is not as fresh. Yeah. Yeah. And we we do a lot of stuff. Like uh, when we take teams on, like we get there early, we treat it like a professional setting. Um, you know, they walk the field themselves or with a friend and just kind of like think about the game and, and do like a lot of visualization. Um, it was, it was a culture where like I did it in, in Europe and I, I brought it here. 
Um, and you see the professionals do it. They go and walk the field and stuff. And, and to some, like that, it didn't feel like here, why are we doing this? And then they saw the value in it and would get there early. And it's more just to get out that social. So that way we have that time to warm up and we could start to focus. But yeah, I, I think, um, I think a lot of that, that piece is, is so important. Self-reflection for me is, is massive. Um, I spend a lot of time doing it still now. Uh, my phone is filled with, with notes and, and voice notes with so many different things. I remember looking back on some journals that I wrote from back when I first started coaching um, in England and to now how much has stayed the same and how much has, has changed. So when you're talking about being very self-aware of what you're doing well and also what you can improve on, is there one mental quality that you see as a precursor to eventual success that if you can master this, you can be successful in sport? Yeah. Yeah. I think as if we're talking female athletes, um, especially is, is the confidence piece. I was someone who was always confident, but sometimes I knew when I wasn't confident, I kind of masked it into this immaturity and, and being funny and, and joking around. Um, but now reflecting on me from my youth days, me through high school and me through college, then into England. And now how much I've kind of changed in the way I speak or the way I present myself or the way I talk about confidence with our athletes. Like I tell my athletes, you have to think you're one of the best in Canada. Like I say, I'm one of the best coaches in, in Canada and that didn't come easy, but I know I am. And that's the confidence in me um, speaking. It's not that cocky. And there's the, obviously the two difference, but I try to tell my players be the best in what you can do. And we really try to empower and have that confidence in our players. Even like players come to me when they first join our program or like, Coach Marie, I'm scared to call a college coach. Like, I don't want to pick up the phone and do that. Um, and I was someone at first when they would tell me that I'd be like, well, what do you mean? You just pick it up and you talk to them. But I was confident to do it and I didn't mind doing it. But I know some people are introverts and, and definitely sh uh, shyer. So we try to help our athletes out with that confidence piece and picking up the phone call and calling a college coach or writing, even writing an email to a college coach um, is something we, we try to help them with. Or I really like when players come up to me and say, hey, Coach Maria, why didn't I play a lot? What could I do better? That doesn't happen often. And I want that conversation to happen. Not your parent calling me or, or telling me, you come up to me and you ask me why you're not playing. So we try to instill that in our players and it's it's helped. We've we've kept a lot of players in the game. We get a lot of players who um, come to us and say, hey, I, I want to quit. I had a bad experience with this team or this coach or this kind of avenue. We try to keep them in sport. And I think it's just the confidence piece for them, especially on the female side. So when we did our, our pre-interview, you shocked me with a statistic about early onset burnout in girls sports. Can you talk more about how to alleviate that kind of percentage of girls quitting? Yeah. So um, Fast and Female put that out. Um, I'm a part of that organization as a volunteer ambassador. It's a nonprofit. We help girls in, feel empowered, be involved um, across Canada. Um, it's in almost every sport. Um, we also do Paralympic, Paralympic sports as well. Um, any sport possible or any kind of avenue for a player we help. Um, I have some um, ambassadors that we work with on different sports I didn't even know about or didn't have any knowledge in. Um, I actually talked to an ambassador um, in Quidditch and I didn't know it was yesterday. I didn't even know Quidditch was a sport. And I was so intrigued that they said, the first thing they said to me, and I, this was just yesterday was, hey, uh, you might think I'm nerdy, but I play Quidditch and I'm trying to get to the Canadian games. And I, I, I said, I don't think you're nerdy. I go, I don't know anything about Quidditch except for obviously watching Harry Potter. And I didn't even know it was a sport. So I asked them like for 45 minutes about the sport, the rules and everything. And um, it was a moment because they felt so empowered to talk about it because I'm sure they don't obviously it's, it's not a conversation that comes up every day. So I think with like the whole empowering and the statistic is, is trying to get people inspired and, and have role models um, I look back and, you know, we talked about it, like how much women's soccer has, has from where it was to now, like my role models, like I had female role models. I never had a female coach until college. Um, so I didn't have a female role model where I could kind of say like, Oh, like you, you can relate to like, 
being on your period or having menstrual cramps before a performance, like you never had those people to talk to. And now, it now players do. So I think with the whole athletes quitting the sport, the statistics is almost half. Um, and how can we keep them involved? Um, can we keep them involved in, if they don't want to play, maybe the social media side, maybe hosting podcasts, maybe becoming a referee, um, getting involved, coaching. So we try to help our athletes do that. Obviously we want to see them go on and, and play, but sometimes injuries and stuff suffer. And we have some players who are injured, who have quit the game, who have moved away, who have messaged us to say, Hey, KL, can I stay involved? And whatever I can help them out with, I will, um, putting them in group chats or featuring them on my page or on my social media page, or just chatting with them about what they're up to, I think, um, is huge. And we're trying to change that conversation here, but the statistic is too high. Um, and players leave due to so many reasons. And, and one of them being that confidence or just, um, that pressure is, is one of the biggest, um, aspects of it. So what's the age range for that 50%? 13 to 16. So that, that, uh, you know, eighth grade, um, into grade 10, um, 10th grades, I see, I see change in between a Canadian <laughs> because you know what? Some of my friends from America are going to listen to this and laugh at me. And then some of my Canadian friends are living. I always do that now. And everybody's like, well, what is it? Grade eight or eighth grade. So, but yeah, that's the statistic in there. Um, and um, I see it all the time. I know so many players who, who I've known about or seen play that aren't playing anymore. And whenever I see them, I say like, how can you get involved in sport? Because it's given you so much of your life and not everybody's going to go and play on the national team, but there's so many avenues, especially as a female now, um, in sport and in the community. So do you still keep up with the, the women who you played with when you were younger? And if so, what are they doing? Are they still in the sport? Are they refing? Are they coaching? Are they still involved in the atmosphere? Um, one of my uh, childhood teammates, friends, um, was coaching in the States for a while. She just moved back to, to Canada, um, during, during the pandemic and is coaching part-time and working in, in the business world. So when she moved back, like seeing her now, um, is amazing. I get to see her twice a week now. Um, and she's, she's coaching. It was her full-time role, but now it's part-time, but she's still in it. But I would say a lot of women that I played with aren't involved in sport. They're not even, pardon me, they're not even playing like a women's pickup league or they're not, they're not playing um, as much. So a, a lot of the players that I know, especially in my collegiate days, aren't playing or aren't involved. Um, I think only one of my college teammates is a coach um, now, um, but part-time, um, but that's about it. So it's, it's a crazy stat, not only in soccer, but like even college athletes that I hung out with, like basketball, softball, um, different sports, they're not involved. So the statistic is, is, is so small, but the problem is, and I still get it all the time is people say, Oh, you could get paid to do that. Or, Oh, that's your full-time job. Like, do they just don't know this avenues you could do this for a profession. And that's something we need to, to post everywhere and change that conversation that yes, you can do this as a an avenue as a profession and get paid and have a roof above your head which I get it still all this time people can't believe I'm a, I'm a full-time coach so how did you get to full-time coaching from playing was it just something that you could not live the rest of your life without or was it a natural transition yeah like I said I moved back from school um I, I was in a, a really serious relationship and um, it ended and I knew I always wanted to be a coach and I was coaching part-time and um, I was coaching part-time and working for, for Nike and I had a huge opportunity to move up within Nike. Nike was my job. I was working in, in retail with Nike since I was 15 and I moved up with Nike really fast and they I said, hey, we want you to move or we'll relocate you. Um, we want you to take a bigger role with the company. What do you say? And I was kind of like, wow, I can move up and, and be in retail, but is it something that I want to do? And um, a good friend of mine in, in retail through Nike was like, is this something that you see yourself doing, like working here? And I, I love the company. I mean, <laughs> who doesn't want to work for one of the biggest uh, athletic organizations? Um, and uh, I just kind of said, I want to be co a coach. And I didn't know if there was money in it. I didn't know if 
Um, I could do it full time. I thought I'd go get my license, come back, do it part time, but have more experience and, and be paid a little bit uh, more and take on teams. Um, but I knew I had to go and, and get my licensing. And at the time, I wanted to challenge myself in the hardest place to get your licensing, which is England, because you see it on TV. It's the best league in, in the world. Um, and they produce some of the best coaches and, and players. So that's where I wanted to go. But I didn't think it would be be kind of full time. And I didn't see myself until I moved back and I worked in the I worked for an MLS organization and my name started to get out there where I get where I was starting to get calls to say hey come work for us can't come work for us and I said wow like I, I could do this full time um so yeah I just kind of took a risk at it but it obviously paid off but it wasn't easy I remember coming back in 2015 with 31 dollars to my name and that was it um and now um years later uh, I own a house I have a car like I I'm I'm obviously putting money away for my my retirement but yeah I'd never thought if I could look back on my 2015 self and say, I was 25 at the time, Hey, this is going to pay off. There was moments where I didn't think it was. And I would have to go back into working at, at, at a retail store or, or going back to school or to become, to get my a master's or another BA or something like that. So what's your BA in? What's, yeah, your, so, um, what's your educational background prior to coaching? Yeah. So psychology, which is, which is crazy. Um, and I, and I, I talk about the psychology side of things is I, when I was uh, in school, I went in liberal arts. I didn't know it's so tough for someone at 18 to know um, what they want to do and why I took psychology um, and got into it is because I got an A in it. And I was like, wow, like this is my, the only course that I did very well in, and maybe I should do this. Um, and it, it, there's so many comparisons to on the field and like the psychology aspect to, to, um, to school. So, and to the field. So that's what I, I kind of, uh, started to get into. And I, I loved it. Like, I love that side. Some of my best friends are psychologists now that played sports. So I know we talk about that all the time. Um, one of my, one of my good friends, Lindsay Corbett in, in Pittsburgh now, she's a child psychologist. So like, you know, she was a, a softball athlete and now doing that. So, kind of working with with youth in in that so it's 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 great and I think it's very complimentary of the sport um, and I try to advocate for more people to look at the psychology aspect of it because a lot of athletes I find go into like exercise science PT um, which is which is great but that's one aspect of the sport there's so many others um, that they they can go into and, and look as a career so what was I mean you went you have this psych background when was the first time you experienced sports psychology? So psych that was specific to sport. Yeah, I think when um, for for myself as a coach, um, it like obviously as a player, I experienced it all the time. I just didn't know, like obviously with the psych background, you start to understand like terminology and all of that. But as a player, I never knew knew, knew that. I would obviously like just channel those those emotions and those feelings and never really express them a lot um, because you, you obviously as a player, you didn't know, but I remember a moment for me as a coach to really use my psych background was I was coaching at MLS Academy and we were playing and our head coach got kicked out and I took the team. So I'm taking these MLS boys as a female. And I already had this pressure of being a f the first female coach in this MLS Academy and having that pressure of being a female um, and getting called all kinds of things sometimes from, from the coaches that I was working with, never from the players, the players respect me and said, Hey coach, we want to win this game for you, but I'll never forget this moment. And this was something that I had to use my psych background because I wanted to leave the sport as I was called in the middle of the game, a whiny female coach for advocating for my players. I know it's, it's crazy. And I'll never forget that moment because I, I was in the middle of a game and I didn't agree with the referee's call. And I wanted an explanation as to why cards, yellow cards weren't being handed out on both sides. I'm not saying our team was, in, in the right. And they were definitely, it was pretty much 50, 50 and it should have cards should have started being given because it needed the referee needed to uh, assert himself in the game. So that way there was no fighting. These are 14 year old boys at the time um, or th 13 or 14 year old boys. And I felt that he needed to do a job to say, we need to calm this down. He had just kicked out our head coach. So obviously our teams riled up the other teams riled up. Um, and yeah, I was called a whiny female coach. So I remember going back to my car and calling basically everyone in my phone book to vent about that moment, because I was like, I, I don't understand. Like, 
I don't understand what I did, what I did wrong or why I was called that. And I really thought about that moment and, and, you know, am I a whiny female? Am I, am I that coach? And I was a big moment to say, no, I'm not. And I have to rise above it and not let that comment um, affect me. And uh, now I joke around about it, but at the moment I was like, I don't want to be called that. Do I even want to stay in the sport and do this? If this is what my path and my journey is going to be like. So when, when that sunk in, that that was your reception, did you change anything or did you just continue to be yourself? Yeah, I think uh, I, there was two parts of it. I think when I was called that, I looked at some of like, I was copied in some emails with, with coaches who said, well, I don't think Maria is going to be a good fit on our, our bench and a good uh, like response to the boys. Right. And they didn't know I was on that email and I'm reading it. Like, so I'm, I'm thinking about those scenarios as I'm picking up codes, even though I'm a higher license than the MLS coach on the field, but I'm just picking up codes and kind of just standing there while he's doing the session. And, and I know it's because of female. So I looked at that side and said, maybe whiny female coach in a male dominant sport, I'm always going to be called this. And then I looked at some of the female players I was coaching on the side, or I knew, and some of my family and, and my friends. And I looked at that side as well. And I said, we need a female coach. I need to be a voice here in Canada. I need to be a voice. So it was kind of like, you know, both those, like a devil and angel on your shoulder, like kind of those moments. But I knew I had enough thick skin to let that comment go and forget about it. It didn't, it wasn't like overnight. And it's, it's, it's still like thinking about those memories still a little bit rouse me up, not to the point where I'm going to quit the sport, but it was definitely like a tug of war to think about those emotions and really deal with them. It wasn't easy. That's insane. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's crazy. It was not a great experience. It was a very good life lesson that MLS Academy and being a part of that, but I couldn't take it anymore. And I wanted to get into the female game, not because I didn't think I could handle the male game. It's just because I didn't think I needed to prove myself after coming back from England and getting all these licensing and, and spending all this time there and sacrificing so much. I missed the birth of my, my godson and like so many family events and uh, as an athlete being away from home, you miss all those events, but like little moments like that, I'm missing all of that. And I'm like thinking all my career of, I, I, there's so much like I work towards that. I don't want to, to, to give that up. And I eventually left that and got into the female game. And obviously I'm involved in the male game, but female soccer is where I want to go, but we needed more of me. And that's what I wanted to create. And now obviously here in Canada, we've created so many great female coaches and there's so many coming up in the game. And I think I was part of that, that movement. Can you tell us what team it was that that all went down in? Yeah, yeah, I, I'm fine with it. It was, it was Toronto FC and it was unfortunate that it was our home team and homegrown um, team here. But yeah, like uh, even as like a, a someone who's part of the LGBT community, like coming out and saying that as well was something that was was tough. And like, uh, you know, and I obviously came out to, to my family and, and friends. It was like uh, Italian culture. Like I'll never forget my grandmother was like, didn't understand it. Cause she didn't speak English. And then she's like, Oh, like you're, you're like Ellen. Like, and she kind of like knew it that way. I know, I know, I know it was Ellen. Cause obviously she spent so much time in front of the TV, but I didn't have a bad experience, like being uh, coming out of, uh, in the LGBT community. But I remember in those moments of being with TFC, I was so like nervous to say, Oh my God, like, I, I'm dating now or like this was my past and like I, I, I have to miss this event and like they'd be like oh wh where are you going and like I'd be scared to say it and I remember their faces when I told them and I was just like I, I don't I feel accepted and I know they're accepting it but do they truly accept it and um, yeah it, it's something that's still um, uh, everybody obviously like I, I speak about it my my fiance is part of my my life she's like my like my like she's basically does all the man, man, managerial stuff to like keep me on the business side of things in shape. But I think now I'm more open about it and like more confident, but before I was very much, and that was a huge part of me, like carrying that burden of like not being able to express myself part of that, that culture. So that was a good moment because I learned so many life lessons from that experience. I was there for about eight, eight months. Um, I thought I would be there forever, like working for TFC, wearing the badge, wearing the kit was amazing, but it was some dark, some dark days for sure. And I 
I know I was getting pushed aside because I was a female. Um, and um, yeah, it was, it was very tough, but good people in the, the industry there, but um, also uh, um, people that, that definitely needed to take a little bit of a reality check to say, hey, listen, just because I'm a female doesn't mean I'm any different than you. And sometimes I find it's, it's, it's the, the male or the coaches that have a problem with it, not the players. Every player there, like I still see some of the players, like the boys there, there wasn't, oh, hey, there was our female coach. There was, hey, there was Coach Maria. There was, she coached us then. Um, it wasn't, um, you know, it was a female coach. But definitely being in that male-dominant industry was, was tough. So how did, how did you feel when the players were more accepting of you than the men who hired you? Yeah, it, it, like I couldn't lean on anyone. Like I couldn't, I couldn't, like there were some people that were great in that academy that I could lean on, but I didn't want to tell them all my problems and what I was experiencing. Like when I was called a whiny female coach, um, uh, someone who was involved in the team is now the president of Canada soccer and his son was on our team. And I remember going to him in the parking lot and him like his face like dropped, but nothing was done. No, no one kind of supported me in that. It was talked about but it wasn't addressed more. It wasn't, Hey, we should go after this club, the coach that called me that and like say something, we should put something in writing to say, this is not okay. Nothing was done. I expressed how upset I was about it, but I, I would have hoped they would have taken that to say, Hey, you're our first female coach. We want to keep you here. Let me take this story to Canada soccer to Ontario soccer, but nothing was done. And that was in, in 2015. And I hope now maybe that they would do that if that, if that situation came about it. But I remember the first couple calls I made were to family and friends and I, to the boys, I couldn't like confide in the boys in that moment to say like, Oh my God, like this is what I was called. I had to like hear him say that the, the referee not kick him out and still play the game. And we, when we end up losing and like have that conversation of now we've lost with the boys, I was called this, but hide all those emotions and just, just be a coach. Um, and it was, it, oh my God, it's like one of the toughest days in my experience, but yeah, I, I hope that that organization and the MLS does a better job at working with females within their organization. Like I was on a, a clubhouse the other day and we were talking about how many females are actually involved in the first team at MLS organizations. And I don't know of one, I know some are involved, like I was in the academy setting, but not, never anything higher than that. And I'm hoping that conversation changes, but it's definitely not easy being in an MLS academy as a female. So when, when we're looking at females coming into coaching positions on professional teams, we're seeing it in football and in baseball and Obviously, there's not really a, a well-defined female equivalent to either one of those. I mean, there's softball for baseball, but it's obviously not the same. With a co-ed sport like soccer, where you have a female equivalent to a male coach who does really well, were, was, there ever, was there ever any pressure to just go back to female sports? Yeah, I, I think at the time I wanted to get back in into the female game because there was no uh, there's not a lot of female coaches um but i even look now um recently like uh, you know um the chelsea female coach just got an offer to coach afc wimbledon um and she would have been one of the first female coaches being in charge of a male first team and i just remember reading that twitter article and then i was like oh this is amazing like good for her but i was i was petrified to go and read the comments and to my surprise the comments in there were like, uh, she obviously spoke about those comments as well, but me being such like a small part of like the youth game and not being at the professional level, I can only imagine her feelings being at that high stage and reading these comments because she openly said like she had read those comments and to, to read some of the comments. Oh my God. I like, I still like, even like around like racial matters or uh, female footballers or uh, uh, male footballers of color. And I go on and read their comments. I just don't know how they deal with that side of things. And, you know, and then like try to ch channel that into how do I deal with it? Cause obviously like I have a good following on Instagram and I do get hate all the time uh, as well. Um, I see things written about me that maybe aren't, they don't at me, but I know it's about me. Um, and it's just this culture where um, it, it's definitely tough. So you have to have that thick skin. So yeah, I try to, to do, to have that now. 
Um, but I think those life lessons and, and having a positive attitude and, and letting that stuff roll off is something that I, I try to try to vent. And obviously I have a good circle around me, um, friends, family that I definitely talk to about my problems and they talk to me about theirs, but I can kind of talk about it. We could joke or laugh about it, talk about how it can affect me and then go about it and just kind of leave it in the, in the past. So when you're looking at how to be a better coach, what kind of content are you consuming? Are you looking at these articles that are coming out about professional coaches or are you reading books that they've written or, I mean, are there podcasts or TV specials? How are you using different mediums to make yourself a better coach? Yeah. And I think through the pandemic, I've spent a lot of time investing in, in myself and through podcasts, I'll listen to anything, not even just soccer po podcasts, but I'm really big into stories and documentaries and hearing about players lives and their experiences growing up. And um, now them being a professional player, a professional coach. So I think a lot of their stories have shaped them into the person they are now. And that's obviously something everybody does, but I think some of their stories coming through hardships um, are things that I can obviously relate to or like single parent families like myself um, and, and, and be able to relate to that and said, Hey, they got to this stage. I experienced that as well. You know um, we experienced that similar role, but we're doing great things for the community. So I think finding those outlets and, and, and people within like books and stuff. I'm, I just finished Pele's book and listened to his story that he, we had like, a piece of bread with banana on it all day. And that's, that's all he was. And then he went on and like played hungry and was like one of the best players to ever play. And yes, I didn't go hungry, but to him to have that, that drive and that fight and to come from poverty into what he is, or like Jamie Vardy who worked in a chicken factory and no one thought he would become a professional footballer to be one of the best in England. Like there's like those stories in there that, that I absolutely love. So those are my outlets. I love reading about stories, especially female um, female footballers or female players in the sport and what they went through and all the similarities that uh, female footballers or, or athletes or coaches in any sport go through um, and how I can relate to that and their message of how they overcame it. And maybe it's different than mine. And I pick up a tad um, um, or something from them. So we already talked about fast and female. Can you also talk about changing the game? Yeah, so changing the game is through Coaches Association of Ontario. It's um, coaches across Ontario in many sports who advocate for females and getting females into roles and coaching roles and uh, managerial roles, uh, refereeing. So uh, as, a, as kind of mentees and, and uh, apprentices, we try to help new coaches who are coming in this on the female side. Um, we kind of talk to them about what they're struggling with um, what they're going through and how we can help. So under me, I had someone not in soccer for the first time in, in rugby. So it was nice hearing her being a rugby, um, international player or, or professional player in rugby and the struggles she had in trying to get into the male game and, and being a female coach and her struggles. So I really like loved listening to her story and, and hearing her challenges and how I kind of overcame that, even though we're not part of the same sport, those daily struggles of the coaching industry and how I overcame it and giving her tips. So changing the game is, is amazing. Um, we do like workshops together and there's like assignments to, to help each other. And like um, reflection is huge and so many different skills that you need, but yeah, I've been a part of it since, since day one. And I continue to see it grow and um, so many amazing people on the, the panel and that are in charge of it that want, to see more females and their big thing is getting females into top leadership positions. And that's what they always say to us. We want to see you in a top leadership position um, in your sport um, or in the community. And that's something that empowers me and empowers the, the, the female coaches that come into our program. So you mentioned on your, you, when you scheduled for this interview, you mentioned that you wanted to talk about running a combine and the process that went into creating the successful event. Do you wanna, do you wanna talk about that? Yeah, so uh, we ran a combine Halloween. Um, it, it was uh, something, so I obviously went to England, um, came back in 2015. 
um, and hadn't been back since. So I turned 30 January um, 2020, right as like coronavirus was like starting to be talked about and stuff. So I went to to England. Um, I ended up um, going across England and uh, actually had a chance to go and work with the Italian Federation um, that I had played for and that my friends are within, but I met someone in England as I was traveling. And basically my mom paid for my, my birth as my birthday gift, my 30th birthday gift. She's like, I'll pay for your flight. You go, don't worry. Cause we were, it was between Hawaii or going uh, and to learn in England and spend two weeks in England. I could have been on a beach, but I just said, I want to go in and see what, where soccer is now from when I left England to now. Um, and I went and I met someone, Jimmy Hayes and, and, and Chris McGrath and, they opened the doors for me. Um, Jimmy is a scout with Man City and he opened the doors to say, hey, listen, we want to be able to bring female players here to um, to the United Kingdom. We want to bring female players to play against the best academies. And I was like in his face every day, like, hey, Jimmy, you're a scout. Look at this player. Look at this player. This is who I work with and stuff. And he's like, OK, Maria, he's like, do, can, do, can you miss going to Italy? And I was like, oh my God, like, I don't know, like this is working with the Italian Federation. Like, you know, they, they opened the doors for me, but I said, okay, Jimmy, I'm going to miss that. And I'll go back for that. I'll, I'll come, I'll, I'll stay with you and we can talk about ideas. So we planned this event to run this combine in this camp to get female players in front of scouts. Um, and the plan was to bring these scouts to, um, to Canada to see our players, but then the pandemic hit. And I remember announcing that we were going to do this combine in March, like literally three or four days before the pandemic, we announced that we were going to run this combine and it was scheduled for the summer. Um, and I remember every, like we had like 250 people on the call to say, Hey, listen, we're trying to bring players down to, to England. We're trying to get players to play professionally and players here don't know that's an option to go down to Europe and play as a professional player. So I was trying to change the game, change the conversation to say, Hey, listen, you can become a professional female footballer. So we scheduled this camp and um, no one knew about Corona at the time and, and COVID and lockdowns and what was going to happen. And uh, the summer, so I thought it was going to be two weeks. And I was one of those people like, oh, we'll be back in two weeks. I'll see you in April. I remember going on Instagram live and my players were like, hey, like, we'll see you in April. We had an event scheduled, um, a, like a small like showcase scheduled at the end of April. I'm like, yeah, it's still on. It's still on. And then you read more about Corona and all the effects that was happening. And uh, we moved the combine um, and we postponed it and we postponed Jimmy and Chris coming. And um, it was a lot of planning um, and a lot of the players had worked up to that moment. We were training on, on zoom, like most people and getting them ready. And all our, our talks were this combine's happening. This combine's happening. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. And they're working so hard and stuff. And then the summer hits and we weren't allowed to, to con contact sport. Um, and we're like, we're going to do it. It's going to happen. And we're still like keeping everybody engaged. And I would say out of the 250 players, a lot dropped out, but the ones that stuck with this idea that we are going to do this showcase and this combine um, who stuck with it. Um, we ended up running it and we were allowed to do it. The fields closed November 1st here. So we ran it October 31st on Halloween outdoors, which was freezing cold. Jimmy and Chris obviously couldn't watch, but we did it virtually and for players to be assessed and to get a written feedback from a, a professional scout and several professional scouts was huge. And that moment of them getting back and some of them, there was their first games since March or since last year, it had almost been a year since they played and to see them out there playing and, and competing and, and um, being together. And a lot of them didn't know each other. Um, a lot of them just came together and we didn't have, we couldn't have like an abundance of coaches and people like, watching we took 50 players only um and they stayed with their groups and they um ate lunch and they they hung out together it was, it was a massive moment um we ended up selecting two teams of girls to go down our plan is to hopefully go down this year um we got amazing game schedule but to see that group and then for them to get their letter of hey you've been selected was was amazing and i stayed out of all the selections because a lot of those were my players. And I said, I'm not assessing any of our players. I'll run this event, but I'm pretty much just going to be walking around and making sure that everything is running on time, but I'm not going to watch any of these players play. Um, and why? Because I don't want to be biased. I want you to see 
the players I've talked about or the players that you've seen and see if they're good enough to come. And we ended up selecting a lot of the players I thought we would. And uh, we formed two teams and our plan hopefully is to go in July um, for our players. Um, but again, with, with COVID it's just, you never know, but I think even if we don't go, it's that they feel empowered and they feel confident that, Hey, I've been selected by a scout and I've been selected by a premier league scout that I'm good enough to get a trial over in England. Wow. That's so cool. Yeah. It was amazing. It was amazing. And a virtual combine is definitely tough to run um, with, with doing everything virtually, you know, like we had to like move the camera a bunch of times, but again, um, you just roll with the punches and roll with how to change things. So when we're still, while we're still on the topic of virtual experiences, can you talk about translating the technical side of practices into a virtual setting? So if you're consulting with a player over zoom and that's how you're doing your, your private coaching lesson. Yeah. So the first lockdown in March to end of May, I thought I found it a lot easier because everybody was adjusting. Like everybody was like, okay, if this is the way we have to train, this is the way we have to train. It's not ideal, but we'll focus on touches on the ball. We'll focus on like watching games and breaking down games. So I found that, lockdown was a little bit easier plus being in in toronto obviously it was warmer and it was spring so players could like bring their camera outside and do it in their backyard or on their deck or or uh, on the street and like i could see them in bigger spaces so i could get more creative on what we could do and then the summer happened we were allowed to do training outside social distance um, but we ran like summer programs, no, no games, but just, we could run training and they could see each other, not on, on the screen. And then, um, we went into the second lockdown, um, which was, uh, winter time. And I found the level drop. We used to get like 80 plus players on our calls. We did it all for free. Um, and, um, we ended up getting this lockdown 20 players at most, sometimes 30 on the calls. The problem was, is that they were training in sometimes their, their bedroom in a little space with no shoes. Cause they didn't have anywhere and they couldn't go outside or they're training in their garage all bundled up with so many clothes on. So this one was tougher. So what we decided to do, instead of focusing on touching the ball and not having space, um, we did a little bit of match analysis, but. Um, we did strength and conditioning. So we had strength and conditioning coaches come on that you didn't need any space really, maybe just like a couple feet and you could just do strength and conditioning workouts. Again, we offered it for free. We didn't charge anyone. We did it out of, out of, we wanted to keep athletes engaged. And then I ran this series on Instagram every day. We interviewed one person or two people, or sometimes three people on our, on our, uh, Instagram every day from all over different walks of, of social media to coaches, to players, to referees, et cetera, et cetera. And we ran that every day. So I think from January to February, we ended up interviewing 90 plus people and I did it every day. So I would like go walk my dog or like uh, do something and rush home at 3 PM um, to be on these calls. But I think it inspired a lot. We got a lot of good compliments for it. And I just wanted to do as much as I can to keep players motivated and engaged. And now we're back into small settings um, indoors, which is nice. So it's nice finally seeing the kids as much as you want to go and give them a big bear hug. You can't, but it's nice finally being back and being able to see them in person and, and, and do more in, in bigger spaces than in their bedroom. So can you talk about all of the programming that your private coaching does? So for example, you mentioned project three, can you talk about that as well as your other private coaching experiences? Yeah, I, I kind of get choked up talk, talking about Project 3 because when we first started it, um, so Project 3 stands for three pathways into a female player. Um, so Canadian, um, American scholarships, and then players going into Europe. So three pathways. Why we also call it that because I've, I've done the three pathways. Yes, I didn't play in university or college here in Canada, but I grew up playing here. Um, and then I played overseas and I played in, in, in the United States. So I wanted to have these avenues for a player to say, Hey, coach Maria, I don't want to play here in North America. I want to go somewhere else. Okay. We can help you with that. Or, Hey, I want to stay in Canada. We can help you with that. So project three is for elite female athletes. It's all supplementary. So we're not a club or Academy players come to us twice a week. Well, before COVID they were coming to us to, twice a week 
they train with us and then we help them get tutored. We have a tutor on staff. We help them um, with all their training. We help them prep for their SATs. We monitor their grades. We get them recruited or we get them filmed. Um, we have a strength and conditioning coach. We have a nutritionist. So basically they come to us, they're part of this program and they everything they need to be an elite athlete, we help them out with that. With not taking away from their feet, their their team training with their other club they're playing with, this is something they focus on the side. So we started it. We had like 180 players out at tryouts. We ended up selecting a group, um, and it's it's bittersweet this year because a lot of them are in grade 12. Um, they're they're seniors and they're graduating. They're they're going on to school. We've helped them all. Most of them get scholarships. Obviously, with some, we're still working with COVID. It's 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 delayed the process a little bit, but it's going to be hard for them to leave. And I've never had this many kids. Um, we have like 60 plus 2021s with us for this many kids to be leaving us. Um, so it's, it's sad, but I'm so excited to see them on their journey. All of them are doing something within the sports uh, industry. Some of them are deciding to play here in Canada. Some of them are going to the States. A couple of them are going to play in Europe. So we're so happy to see all of them. We still have a lot of athletes that we're currently trying to help go um, and find a, an opportunity. So that's where my networking and my my network comes in is every day I will try to help these av uh, athletes get to that next point. Um, and if they don't go this year because of COVID, they'll take a gap year. And those are conversations obviously we had with them and it was tougher to have those conversations. But the reality is with COVID, it's tough to get a scholarship and it's tough to get on a team because of the unknown. Right. So um, yeah, it project three is great. We offer it to any high school athlete and why I like it is because here in Ontario players can't play with different age groups. And if you want to go on and play at the next level, even though you're 14, you have to be able to play with someone who's 18. And then when you're 18, you have to be ready to play with someone who's 22 in school. So we create those pathways. So our young players who are in eighth or ninth grade who come in, get to play with all these older players. And um, for them, it's kind of a shock. But what I love about the culture we've created is when I say go pass, it's never this group passes with this group, this passes, this group passes with this group. They find whoever's next to them, they grab them and they pass. Um, and that's huge in a, in a female culture. And our female athletes who are the seniors who are like the grade 12s and older on the team, they'll work with the younger girls because they know they were there at one point and they were younger. So we've created this culture to, to help out. And we all want to see every player who comes through our program go on. So it's amazing. Um, we also, in our program, we try to get some of the girls to coach within it. So we keep our fees low that they won't have to pay for the session or pay for the program if they come and volunteer with our little kids. Cause obviously project three is for the elite athletes. And then we offer supplementary training for anywhere from you. We've had some under fours come in all the way up to like, yeah, it's, it's really cute. We actually had a bunch of moms reach out like 18 months. Do you do anything for 18 months? And I don't think we're there yet. Um, but, um, our girls help out with these programs. So they're giving back. And a lot of them loved the coaching side of things. Like yesterday, one of our, one of our players, Iman, who's going to play professionally in Spain, she ran a session for U10 girls and I couldn't be there because I was at another session and the parents messaged me and said, who is this? Who is this player? The girls absolutely loved her. Like they want her every week. So she's 17, uh, almost 18 working with these girls. And I now like some of these girls can look up to her and she's like, I said, Iman brag about yourself, tell your story, tell, tell them you're going to play pro um, and stuff. And obviously she's like, no coach, I'm a little shy. I'm like, tell them like that they have this opportunity. So that's what we try to create. It's been amazing. Um, the girls are absolutely gems. I don't see them as often because of the different regions you're not allowed to travel in. Um, but I can only, I can't wait till I can see them again and, and be able to, to be with them. We have another coach, um, my right hand coach, Denita, who runs those sessions with them, but yeah, they mess with me all the time. We're like, coach, come to training and all of this. But yeah, it's uh, we're creating a great culture and a great community. And um, I, I couldn't thank them enough. They inspire me every day. So my follow-up question was going to be, do you continue to correspond with the athletes that you've worked with and then they've moved on? And it sounds like they're still implemented into your, your process. And that's really cool. Yeah, every day 
Yeah, we interviewed a lot of them um, through our Instagram series. We reach out to them. We ask them to come in when they're home from playing professionally or maybe they're playing in, in the United States and come back. Like some of these, it was what was really unique this summer is because we couldn't play games and was just training. I invited a lot of the girls playing in the States or playing in Canada to come and train with our younger kids. And like these kids were like 13, 14, 15 training with division one, division two athletes. And like, I remember them being so nervous. They got, we had a Polish international men's player come in and train with these 13, 14 year old girls. And he knows and, and a lot of the players we have, I said, yes, they're younger, but they, they'll play like they'll rise up. And there wasn't where it was like a huge um, difference in level. Like the younger kids knew they had to train at this level. And it was kind of inspiring because they said, OK, I'm in great. I'm going to grade nine, um, but this is the level I need to get to in order to be like a Kayla or be like an Alex or be like um, a Jocelyn kind of thing. So it's kind of cool to see that and see how they've taken that on. And they still, now they're following them on social media and they're like messaging them all the time. Like one of our players is like, Hey, I, I FaceTime Kayla. I was talking to Kayla, one of our players in the United States. Um, we were FaceTime. I was like, that's awesome. And she's like, yeah, you know, she's giving me so much great advice. And that's what I ultimately want. And a lot of the players, when we do these interviews with them, the last question I ask them is how can, how can people reach out? And they know, cause they've been training with me is shoot me a DM. Like, like, let ask me a question there's no dumb questions ask me connect with me because i'm a dinosaur in, in in soccer i don't play anymore so i want my players to connect with the youth that we're coaching so it's a great culture we're, we're creating and we're just trying to create more role models we want players to have more outlets so it's amazing and then my last question i think i know the answer to this based on how our interview has gone but is what you're doing right now your dream job Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't see myself uh, working and doing anything else, creating this platform and creating it under my name. I remember there was a lot of hate to creating Coach Maria Soccer and creating it under my name. And I'm going to steal players. I'm going to do this. But people who know me in this industry now know I'm just trying to be an outlet and help players out. So, yeah, no, I, I don't see myself doing anything. I just see this getting bigger and in more uh, cities. We're in four cities already. Um, our plan is to keep growing it and creating this culture that the safe space that we want to be able to help out and any player at any skill level, there's no judgment when a player comes in who maybe isn't like, can't pass the ball compared to some of the players who've been with day one. There's not like, Hey, I'm not going to do that. We find that we're creating a culture where that player is now coaching that one. And I could kind of just step back and sit there and let them let them take over like they don't even need me there anymore like I could just literally do like put the balls out and they could run it so that's the culture we're creating yeah it's a dream job it's a dream community and um, anyone who's part of our program um, would agree it's it's amazing to to see these athletes every every day that's uh this is so good yeah you uh, hopefully you could come and see it and you can meet some of these oh these gosh. athletes they uh Honestly, I think all of them could run for prime minister um, one day and maybe one of them would be the, the future face of, of Canada because they're just amazing kids. So do you see them, I mean, how do you assert dominance on a team and lead a team when you're seven years old? Yeah, um, like as a young player? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so, so like we, when you're yeah. Working, when you're working with these youth athletes who are trying to make a name for themselves in U8, for yeah. example, how do you go about doing that? Yeah. So we obviously try to create, first of all, just create people on and off the field. We say, and we always use this, whatever, and this is something we used in college. Once you step across that line, whatever happens, don't take it off. Um, if there's a problem that arises, don't take it to heart because you're trying to better yourself. So I'm someone who doesn't say much. I always say I'm not a, I'm not a joystick coach. I won't tell players what to do. I want them to make mistakes. I want them to learn and I want them to coach. So some of our first conversations with younger players is coach each other, help each other out. Like um, we do a lot of stuff where they have to like say a color or tell the player when to go or shoot. So that way they have this confidence to, to speak and, and, and do that. So it's, it's creating a good little culture. They're like little coaches and little like captains and in, in training, they'll like help clean balls and like organize cones. We give them little jobs and stuff like that, but it's to try and create that uh, communication, create that confidence and um, 
we we don't direct the players a lot. We just give them repetition and make them and hope that they can speak and 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 help each other. We'll stop it and do like the tactical who, what, where, when, why, and how, and have them come up with the answers. So that's kind of what we do with our with our young ones. Um, and th- there's definitely some shy players who come in and d- still don't want to help. But then our 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 ones who are like the leaders and and always willing to work will go in and like take them by the hand and, and help them through the session. So it's a really good culture we're creating. Um, our, we have a 2011 team, so U10, um, and we had them since last year. And you could start to see the leaders starting to rise and how much they're all one group, not just individuals from when we first got them. That's so cool. It sounds like you have a really, it sounds like you're creating an academy setting, but it's yeah. not it's not really an academy. So is there a chance that you could parlay what's happening right now into something that's more formal? Yeah. I think when, if Ontario soccer can, can kind of figure out how we could navigate letting players play with older kids, I think that's something, a conversation I would start to uh, invest in and look into Academy until that, that players like you have to sign a form and then only like a certain amount of players can play a year up, which I don't agree with because if I have a good player, I want to put them in a setting that's older. Not everybody could play up, but I think to limit players from having that uh, idea to play with older players, it's something I don't agree with. So if there's certain things that Ontario soccer can really change um, or Canada soccer for that matter can change in the way we use like uh, academy settings or like, use competition i would definitely put this into an academy but there's still too many uh kinks to to work out like um i'm someone who traveled to the united states a lot for tournaments and now you're not allowed to travel like a certain distance if you're a certain age which i didn't have that and i want players to play with not just the same teams in their local area play with players all over the world because our style of play in Canada is different than America, different than Sweden, Italy, et cetera. So I want our players to have those opportunities. And I think those are the kinks they're going to have to work out before I consider it. But the supplementary training is, is amazing. Um, and I think coaches too here um, don't want players to go and train with other Academy coaches because they think they're going to steal players where me, I'm not stealing anyone because I can't, I don't have a league for them to play and they just come and train with us. Um, so maybe down the line um, and maybe all these athletes who are going to listen to this podcast, cause I will send this out to all of them. Maybe they will take over and, and be the Academy coaches when they're done school um, because they're amazing. That's, that's really awesome. Is yeah. there anything that you think that I missed that you want to talk about? No, I think that was, that was good. No, it was, okay. it was great. And then once this interview is published, I'll um, email you the link to it. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me and happy International Women's Day. And Amen. hopefully, yeah, hopefully you have a good rest of the day and, uh, you. you know, uh, enjoy this beautiful Monday. Bye. Bye-bye.